Hello everyone and welcome to another Motorsport Magazine podcast. I'm Ed Foster and I'm the online editor of Motorsport Magazine. I'm joined by editor Damien Smith to my left, Simon Aaron, features editor, uh, Alan Hyde, who's behind the cameras doing uh, all the audio as per normal, and our guest, um, David Richards. Very warm welcome. Good morning. Um, I'm going to start uh, by saying that this is a world first today. Um, this is with a 9.30 a.m. start, this is the earliest podcast we have ever recorded, <laughs> which doesn't say much for motorsport journalists, um, but it does, I think, give listeners a clue as to the life you lead, because I think you survive on sort of five hours sleep a night, Well, I, I, I'm quite an early riser, actually. I tend to, um, I tend, this morning was a five o'clock start as normal, and uh, so I got a, quite a bit of work done, and then the car coming down as well, so, but um, no, you're getting in good practice for Le Mans next week, so you'll be all right for that. Um, so we've, we've got a, a huge amount to cover today. There's obviously the rallying, sports cars, F1, road cars, um, hotels and St. Moore's. Uh, and actually, we've we had hundreds of questions in, um, so I'm going to sort of pick and choose from those. And one of them said, please, please, please uh, don't talk about F1 and sports cars all the time because David is a rallying man at heart. <laughs> um, so I think we should start with the rallying, um, especially because am I right in thinking that uh, the house you used to live in, the RAC rally, used to pass you when you were a young no, it boy? Was, it wasn't far away. We, we, I come from a little f farming community up in North Wales and right out in the countryside and uh, my brothers and I used to ride our bicycles up to the local forest and watch, um, uh, watch the cars go through and I can remember uh, sort of from 12 years old sort of sitting there at the side of the forest watching the very last car. The army used to be the last cars on the RSC rally in the old days and they, they used to bring the Land Rovers through and Minis through and we sat and watched the very last one and, and ironically um, there was one corner we always used to go to and it was near to a, near to the road, near to the end of the stage and uh, we used to sit on this 90 degree corner and that turned out to be the very, very last corner of the very last World Championship event that I took part in with Arian when we won the championship. Amazing. And, uh, but from that, I guess from that early experience, it was you were always going to do something with cars. You trained in accountancy, am I right? Yeah, well, I, 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 uh, yes, that was a sort of, you know, really, I wasn't a particularly good accountant, but it taught me a few good lessons, I think. But uh, I actually, I had a university scholarship from the RAF, and I was going to do engineering at university and join the RAF, and they, uh, they were very good and taught me to fly when I was 17 years old. So I had my license very young, so I've been flying since then. And uh, you started, uh, you, you tried driving, didn't you? You tried uh, very short. Yeah, I, I had yeah. My, mother, my mother's car didn't last very long, <laughs> and we used to do twelve car motor rallies. And I used to take my brother with me, who was a little younger than me, and we used to um, we used to go down the drive, and we had to disconnect the speedo because we told her we were going to the local youth club, and off we go and do a, the local motor club twelve car rallies. And the car came back fairly battered usually, and we had to give that up fairly quickly. And I managed to find a, a very good friend of mine with a Cooper S, and I navigated from him from there on, and that was the start. The, the story. David, did you find that when you did 12 car rallies, I know, remember from my time at the Sheffield Students Motor Club, most of the 12 car rallies had about 40 cars in them. Yeah, was yeah, was yeah. it the same in North I Wales? I don't think anyone ever counted the, the 12. It's just <laughs> a sort of nominal generic name for those sort of events. Um, the d When you started as a co-driver, obviously things didn't quite work out as, as a driver, but um, how... How did you take to it so well? Why, what what was it that um, sort of made you so good yeah, at it? I, I've, I've no idea. I'm sort of, you know, I'm sort of, uh, I think the co-driving side is quite uh, quite unique skill in terms of, in those days, slightly different from today, there were navigation rallies, remember, we were, in, I was at the end of the Motoring News era. I did the last couple of years of the Motoring News Championship, which was plot and bash on those sort of maps on across North Wales, and it was, you know, you had to have a lot of concentration to do it, and uh, you had to have a pretty sturdy stomach as well. I think, you know, lots of people would have it find it a little tricky to read a map and sort of be hurtled around in a Mini Cooper S at those speeds. Um, and I just got used to it. And um, and it's like being in a, a sort of mobile office. You know, you're sort of at the end of the day with other drivers with Ari and people later on. You are... Um, you're, you're a real mixture of skills. You're sort of, you've obviously got to be fairly calm around the, the whole situation because you're, you know, you're sort of living on the edge and uh, especially with, with Ari as your driver. And you've... Um, but you're you're a bit of a psychologist as well because you get the best out of the driver and what's going on there and uh, and uh, you've got to be a good organizer. So it's uh, I think they're all good training and skills for for future life. Yeah, I've got a little bit of experience in navigation. I did two rallies with Tony Jardine 
and uh, our record well, is well, two. That's an experience. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> two, two starts, two DNFs. So uh, not, not a great record. He keeps trying to get me in for a third go, and I keep resisting, but he's a, he's a hard man to say no to, so <laughs> one day it'll probably happen. But the thing I found about it um, was I got a real buzz out of it, which mm. really surprised me. I, I, I thought I was going to hate it, because I hate mm. being a passenger generally. Mm. And at the end of the first stage, I felt really sick mm. and uh, had to wire the window down and try and lots of, lots of gulping of, uh, of air. But when you start to gel as a, as a partnership, yeah. it's amazing, isn't it? I'd say it's a great rapport. And you sort of, you know, Ari and I have become great friends through, you know, through many uh, difficult times in the early days and right through to, to current day when I chatted to him on the phone only yesterday. So it's, uh, you know, those bonds last for a long time. And uh, you won the championship with Ari. What what made him so special? Because uh, you know, as you alluded to just now, he he was quite um, flamboyant and st with his driving. Yeah, and certainly, sitting next to him must have been eye opening. He he's uh, he's a, a lovely character, and uh, he comes from a very similar background to myself. He comes from a little farming community on the Russian border of Finland, uh, miles from anywhere, and. Um, he, 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 sort of Finland, of course, rallying is almost a national sport there. So he grew up sort of behind the wheel of a car locally on the local gravel roads. And um, I met him for the first time out in uh, Jamaica, where he'd been spotted by Jerry Phillips, who many will know as a uh, motoring journalist of old. And he took him out to Jamaica. And they turned up, and he didn't speak much English at all in those days. And, uh, uh, and we got sort of Somehow we managed to communicate, and he came to Wales to do the Welsh Rally. And I said, well, after the rally, you better come and stay with my parents and come up and see us up in North Wales. And, and in, that's what he did, and we became friends, and sort of from that moment onwards, we did a, a number of rallies together, and away things went. His son now is, is rallying, and he's, he's rallying in, in the new revised BRC. It was great to see the British Rally Championship yep. back. What, what, do you, uh, what do you make of, of the BRC and from what you've seen so far? It's, um, you know, BRC, I, I think rallying's got problems at the moment generally are uh, lots of issues which you know it takes all morning to debate them and how to how to resolve them another matter altogether but if i look back to the old days you used to get all the scandinavians would come to britain because this was the most competitive championship in the world people would come over you'd have a, a lineup with roger clark hanu mikola uh timo mackin and ari the whole lot it was just quite extraordinary um i think the problem we've got today with rallying is the the cars aren't exciting enough. You know, I don't think you. I think that's what excites people about motorsport generally: the flamboyance of the cars. And if you look at the categories of motorsport that are successful, and I think GT racing is a good example of that today. Um, they're cars that people aspire to. They're cars that they long for, and they look great on the track or on the stage. I, you know, I can't get overly enthusiastic about a Volkswagen Polo. I'm afraid. But I guess the the power of the manufacturers now they they've they've got marketing plans they want to market these um, little hatchbacks basically uh, and I guess that's that's the direction we're going in isn't no, it? No, I think I think I think it's actually the legislators of the sport have uh, have directed it that way because of safety reasons and because of uh, trying to sort of well uh, to a certain extent attract manufacturers. You're quite right, but I think uh, you know would they let loose a sort of, you know, one of those Lancia Stratus is on a stage of the RAC rally any longer? Probably not. But uh, the new regulations for 2017 are opening up, so the cars will look a little bit better. I think that might add some excitement to it, and hopefully we can quietly get back to sort of uh, some of the heydays of rallying of the past. Do you think there's, a, there's an argument, um, you know, if you look at Formula One, actually, if you want to properly follow a Formula One race, it's almost easier on TV than it is sat in a grandstand not knowing what's going on. And rallying as a TV prospect is a very difficult thing to cover well. Um, does that, because as everything moves more and more towards TV, is that slightly difficult? with? Well, I, th I, I, I had a different view of the way we should be doing rallying in, because uh, a few years ago I ended up with the TV rights for the World Rally Championships about 15 years ago. And unfortunately, the technology is not where we are today. If we had the technology where we are today, I would have a very different view of what we should be doing. I think now that you can capture material not just from your own crews, but from onboard cameras, from spectators, from everything. And you should put it online. You should create the most exciting um, online experience for each event. And you should just grow the audience. Forget about sort of trying to monetize the sort of the, the TV product, which has been the traditional um, model where you'd sort of make a TV program, like Bernie does, sell it to TV broadcasters. I would just get it on the internet, get a great site developed and 
I do come back to GT racing as well because I think the, the WEC has probably got one of the best websites out there today. And you just get the audience. Once you build an audience, audiences are valuable in themselves for advertising purposes later. And that's how I should have gone about it. And sort of doing a narrow cast approach to it of saying, well, we'll make a TV program, we'll flog it to as many TV channels as we can is just unfortunately not going to work in this day and age. I'd, I'd, you'll be pleased to know you've actually answered about five questions in, in the last <laughs> um, last two minutes, which is great. Um, I'm just going to wind back slightly yeah. to um, your career as a, as a co-driver. Um, there's a question here from David O'Callaghan, um, who's asking, who would you have liked to have co-driven but never had the opportunity? Um, I, I guess Hanno Mikola. Hanno's a, a good friend of mine, and uh, Hanno and I were going to do... Which rally we were going to do? We were going to do something together a couple of years ago, and then Hannah was taken ill, and we didn't end up doing it. And uh, we're just doing one of the classic events. And uh, I've got a lot of time for Hannah. He's a very intelligent chap, and he's a delightful person. He was a teammate of ours at the same time in Ford, and I still keep in regular touch with him as well. He's unfortunately not been very well over the winter, but he's um, he's back and up and running again. I'm told, and off to Florida at the moment. I think. Yeah, he's he's due to come over here for the the Shelsey Walsh celebration middle. Of of July. Oh, well, in that case, I will come to that because Jimmy's yeah. driving one of our cars there. I've lent Jimmy the 6R4 that he drove in the British Championship back in the 80s for us, so I've said he can have that to drive up the hill. I mean, I guess depending on your age, you, you know, you either think of Mickler in a, in a Ford or an Audi in the mm. Group B era. What, what's your, I mean, Group B is going to be celebrating its um, 30th anniversary since it was knocked on the head in 86. Um, what's, what's your position on, on Group B? You know, obviously, a lot of the rally fans just look back at it as the the era. Yeah, it was. They, they were quite extraordinary cars, and um, but it, it, t- it did get a little bit out of hand. Six hundred horsepower motor cars, and uh, sort of on a gravel road with lined by spectators standing on the edge of the road. It's not really. It's a recipe for disaster, isn't it? And um, but uh, interesting enough, we, I've just come back from the Isle of Man this week because I was over at the Isle of Man with Mark Higgins, who's been driving one of our Subarus there with 600 horsepower. And, and I, looked, stuff, yeah. I looked at that going down through the streets of Douglas, and I thought, whoa, if you let that loose in the forest, what that would look like. But, um, but I, I think what happened in that period of time, well, obviously, Balestra put the, the can on the Group B, and the sort of Toivonen's accident, I think, was the final nail in the coffin of that, unfortunately. Um, but there are a whole raft of issues around it. And safety at the time. I think people forget, we look back at rallying today and say, oh, it's all gone wrong, it's sanitised, this has happened, that's happened. But I I think we should be rethinking it again because a lot of the reasons that that some of the measures were put in place back in uh, probably about 15 years ago, maybe a little bit more, um, were for very valid reasons at the time because I think, quite frankly, Max Mosley was getting nearly to the point of completely banning rallying. I think it was getting to the stage the safety was getting so unacceptable um, that things had to happen. Now, if you remember, we sort of, then we said, well, let's just go around as a sort of cloverleaf route. And uh, everyone so says now, oh, it's, that's, you know, it's terrible. We should be doing the sort of the old RAC rally. Well, the cloverleaf route was all about having proper marshalling in place and proper safety plans in place because we didn't have enough people or resources to do a, a linear route around the country like the old RAC rally used to be. Now, perhaps that's changed now. Perhaps we could actually rethink that and go back to that situation. Likewise with the cars. The cars were sanitised down to sort of got to be below 300 horsepower for various reasons. Could we rethink those? I think all these things should go back on the table now that that life's moved on. We shouldn't automatically think they're here forever. Um, Do you you lament the the fact, I mean, the, the... Old RACs, as you say, used to be sort of five days across the length and breadth of the country. Yeah. The safari was part of it. Yeah. The sense of adventure that it, that has been taken away to a degree from the World Rally Championship. No, I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. And uh, But I think you've got to understand why that happened and then revisit it and say, are those reasons still there today? And could we actually go back, add a sense of adventure back to, you know, I loved it when it sort of shot up to Scotland and down through the Lake District and all the rest of it. And th- those were great. But could the roads put up with the traffic? Would the police accept that situation there? I don't really know. Those are lots of things we need to look at. I do think we need more giraffes, though, in the World Rally Championship. <laughs> I think the giraffes and elephants are essential. Yeah, that, that would, yeah but, well, we did do the safari parks yeah, at one yeah. stage. Remember That's Woburn? True, no, Nosley. <laughs> Nosley as well. <coughs> um, isn't, isn't there an element of cost as well? I think some of the teams... When they're complaining about if we made if you made the routes longer without the central service station, there's more cost involved. Well, or no, or that no, that? no, no. I think that was that was partly around the servicing um, because it's it was you know if you had I can remember going to events even Acropolis with 
120 people and about 20 trucks or vans to service. And then we, we decided that we couldn't afford to do that. So we took two helicopters and that seemed to solve the problem completely <laughs> and it worked quite well. Um, but um, no, I, I, nowadays with you don't need to service the cars so regularly. And I think, you know, if you looked at the way... Uh, I remember in Formula One when everyone said, oh, you're going to put the cars in Park Fermi the night before the race. Everyone said, oh, you can't do that. You'll have no cars finishing the race. And look what happens. It's, you get reliability and it builds in. Likewise, if you say to drivers, I'm sorry, there's, there's no service for X number of, of miles on, the, on, on these stages. And you've got to work out the tyres are obviously a limiting factor in that respect. But um, I don't see why you couldn't uh, do those sort of things. So the, the idea of central service... Again, here's something that's back to, you know, again, easy to forget in the midst of time. Um, central service, turn the clock back 15 years ago, we did not have the mobile phone technology we have today. Journalists were chasing after the rally, getting up to finding things out about 6 o'clock in the evening and trying to get their reports in. And it was disaster. The journalists were all saying, well, we can't. None of the mainstream journalists would follow it. It's only enthusiasts like you three guys would come along. So you couldn't get the mainstream along. They wouldn't write about it. So well, if we come back to a central service all the time, the journalists will be able to have time to interview the drivers. They'll be able to get their, we have good communications there. They can get the reports out and we can do a proper press coverage of the event. So that was the rationale for having central service. Now we've got far better communication. So that doesn't apply any longer. So again, we should be rethinking these things. Yeah, I was on the Acropolis recently, and the rally, I wasn't familiar with the rally radio thing, but I mean, at the end of every stage, yeah. the, there are quotes from every driver available instantly yep. uh, online on a, on a local radio network, and it's, it's, it's fantastic. Mm. No, so, so all these things mean you've got to constantly revisit uh, where you were and, uh, and reappraise the situation. Yet another thing journalists are to blame for. <laughs> um, there's, we've got a nice question here from uh, Nick Trott from Evo. Um, he said, I'm interested to hear David's assessment of Colin McRae, but as a racing driver, brackets Le Mans. Yeah, yeah. Well, Colin, uh, I've spoken to a number of drivers, there, and Darren Turner was in the team with Colin at that time. And he and I were chatting about it quite recently, and he said how impressed he was by the way Colin focused on the event and really got to grips with it. Um, it's like so many of these drivers, you know, they, you know, if they transfer to another, uh, another activity in motorsport, they're they're going to be very competent. And uh, long distance sports car racing, not dissimilar to the to the skills you need in a in a rally car. And he, so he's he's particularly good. But then, you know, Colin could turn his hand to most things. Um, now I'm going to wind back to to the birth of. Of ProDrive, mm. um, you retired from from the passenger seat mm -hmm. um, and started ProDrive. What, why why the switch? Did you, cause you, was it because you had achieved everything you wanted to achieve? Or? Uh, it was a bit of everything, really. Um, I had a young family at the time. Um, we were spent, you know, in those days. Uh, don't forget, each World Championship event you go to for three weeks beforehand and practice for three weeks. It wasn't the three days that you have today. So we'd be we'd be camped out in Greece or sort of New Zealand or all parts of the world for three weeks at a time practicing and so it wasn't a great way to bring up a young family and um, we were traveling like gypsies and the kids needed to go to school so uh, we decided that we had to be based back at home and I'd always sort of uh, I'd already started some work with Rothmans advising Rothmans in those days about um, uh, their motorsport plans and their motorsport strategy and and they they offered me the opportunity to to be more involved with them and I sort of said okay I'll take that up and um, so that was the starting point of pro drivers just almost like a, a small consultancy there were only three or four of us at those days and um, and the first year was actually spent I, I say, the first task they said well we've we've just decided to sponsor the March Formula One team this was in 1982 I guess or three eighty two probably and would you go and sort it all out and, and represent us on that and then it was sort of then well, we're thinking you know we need something else in motorsport and I ended up negotiating the, the Porsche contract in those days for the for the Le Mans program with Derek Bell and uh, and Jackie X and the whole the whole gang of them, so it was a, it was a great start. And then, but then I'd always aspired to have the rally team. You know, having been in rallying, I wanted my own team and uh, and uh, persuaded Porsche that we should go rallying. And and in those days, the intent was to go with the Group B uh, 959, which was on the horizon. As it turned out, it was a far too big and heavy car for that task. But nonetheless, it was sort of that was the aspiration. And uh, the interim vehicle was uh, a 911, specially built 911, the SCRS, which we've still got one in our collection. And that's how the rally program started. Um, I do. We've got. I actually got a live question, um, which 
isn't live because this is recorded, but it's it's live <laughs> as of the recording. Um, it's this it's <laughs> really complicated. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, I don't even understand it. So if, if anybody does, well done. Um, we've got lots of questions on your time in F1 and your your thoughts on F1 as it was then and also now. And um, we've got a couple here actually related to specifically ProDrive. Um, one from Paul. Uh, so what series that ProDrive has not competed in would you most want to have a go at? And actually, Phil's asked a similar question um, of, but more is which category would you like to have tried as team manager? Mm. So I think well, we, we um, I think in over the years we've we've done most things in motorsport. We've never raced in uh, sort of NASCAR racing in America, and I don't ever see that's going to be likely. We haven't done much single seater racing, if I'm honest, in the lower categories from sort of you know Formula Three area and uh, GP2 and stuff like that. And again, that's never been our forte because it's mostly around. Um, uh, I think our, our best, we're at our best when we're actually developing and designing the car and then operating the car. Uh, taking a sort of standard formula and taking somebody else's product and racing it, we're not, um, we can do it obviously, but it's not where our skill sets lie because we, we've got the engineering resource to, to build something from ground up. So the one category that still waits a tick in the box and I'm confident will be uh, in the near future is uh, a Paris-Dakar programme. But do, do you do you have any regrets though that I mean you've been involved in Formula One not only with your Rothman sponsorship negotiation but as team principal yep. at Benetton for a year, a couple of years with BAR yep. Honda, but ProDrive as its own entity has come close to having a Formula One entry, but you've not done it on your own terms. Is that still a an itch that needs scratching? I think you can't ignore it, but Formula One has got into rarefied atmosphere these days, and so whereas we could play a role in a Formula One team, the actual ownership of a Formula One team is, you know, I think in, uh, is, I wouldn't say out of the question these days because we could lead some uh, consortium to do that quite easily. But um, it's, uh, it, we've been there, done that, and it's certainly reviewed every year. We sit down and we have sort of strategic review of what we're going to be doing in the next three years and where each of the categories are going. Because some, some programs you look at and you think, well, we should be there. And then a year later you look at it and you think, is that really right for us? And you sort of, you know, put ticks in boxes and, and then we put teams onto it to sort of look to see how we might achieve different things. And But I'd say at the moment, <coughs> Dakar is still one of those that we've got to do. Yeah, I've got pressure on that Dakar point. That's that's very interesting because that's one of the, is one of the last great true mm. adventures, isn't it? It is. Is that what attracts you to it? I think it's, uh, I think the, the fact that you, it's an adventure not just from the participation, but it's from the engineering uh, challenge as well. I think there's a lot more freedom there. And quite understandably, lots of other motorsport categories have got so prescriptive that they don't allow the engineers that great uh, uh, freedom that they, they enjoy. And uh, it gets a bit boring for them when they're just working around sort of minor changes here and there. And, you know, and to be fair to them, the sort of balance of performance in sports car racing has been one of the frustrations for them as well. So we like to find new challenges and we like to do things. And that's to a certain extent, the Subaru exercise that we've just done recently on the Isle of Man, uh, with the sort of Mark Higgins getting around there just shy of 130 miles an hour is, is one of those <laughs> little exercises. It, well, I, I watch the motorbikes and you, you laugh at that idea of the car. I was horrified at the idea of doing that on a motorbike when I saw them. We just stood by the side of the road and we watched these motorbikes go by. I've never seen anything like it in my entire life. It's just, uh, I've seen it many years ago, but I'd forgotten. And until you see it live and you stand by the road, those guys are the heroes in motorsport. Forget any other category of motorsport and just think of motorbikes on the Isle of Man. And that's where they really are special. I, t I, t I went there in 2011, I think it was, and it, to this day it's the greatest motorsport event I think I've mm. ever attended because yeah. it is just so visceral and yeah. um, it's it's also great because it's about the one thing I've been to that Simon hasn't actually been to. <laughs> <yet>. <laughs> I'll, 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 I will get there. It's on the it's on it's on the bucket list. It's got to be on the bucket that list. It's absolutely uh, on the bucket list. That's the two seater dragster ride. Who was the guy <laughs> sitting next to Mark? That was the time before with the big save at the oh, bottom yeah. of the Oh, that was an uh, American journalist. Yeah, anyway, he, his face didn't change He didn't realise. I didn't think he realised what was going on. <laughs> Do, talk, talking of big saves, I mean, there's a very famous clip of Ari, I think it was with Terry Harriman in, was in, in the car. Other man. On the other man, yeah, when, he, when they nearly hit the gatepost. It was through a cattle grid, yes. Yeah, through, 
Did, did you? Are there any moments of, that you had of, of, of a similar nature? How long have you got? <laughs> well, just just talk us through top, a couple. Top of, three. Yeah, top talk three. A couple of the best. Well, ones. funny enough, Harry sent me a picture this week. He said he often sends me little emails with pictures and different things. He sent me an email. Oh, how about this? Is for nostalgia, and it was a photograph of us in Portugal, and it was the uh, it was an early morning of a Portugal rally, and we were running I don't know third or fourth on the road, something like that. Hannu Mikula was just ahead of us in our other team car and we came down a hill and it went on to cobblestones or something like that as they do in Portugal stages and and I heard the, everything lock up and I knew things were and as I sort of heard us go through 180 degrees I thought we were, this is it we're going off backwards into another big shunt and uh, we landed smack bang on top of Hannah Mikola's car <laughs> and um, David Sutton wasn't very amused at that point in time because I think we were like second and third on the event and both cars out on the same corner. So that was a... And then a, there was another similar experience in uh, in Monaco where we'd, we were, we'd done a private entry on Monaco. I can't remember the rationale for it, but there was something. Ford had pulled out and we needed to do Monte Carlo rally to get some points. And so we were part of a private team that was funded by some rather dubious sources in Monaco, if I remember correctly. And the other chap who drove the other car was the, the person who was behind all the funding of the team. And um, we we went off backwards, as we often did, down into a ravine, and it dropped 30 metres down. No, not 30 feet down into a river. And it was, uh, it was quite a big, big accident. And as we climbed back up to the road, we suddenly realised the sponsor in his car was about to pass, so we hid for the next five <laughs> minutes. <laughs> and then... Um, but uh, I suppose some of the bigger accidents I can remember are the team actually. Colin McRae is one of the one of the more famous ones because we uh, we were going to Finland with Colin. It was his first experience in Finland, so I got him into my office before we went, and I sat him down. I said, "Look, Colin, he'd have been about 21 years old, something like that, 22 maybe." I said, "Look, Colin, we we've decided to sort of invest in you to go to Finland because we think it would be a good experience just to sort of learn the roads there, get your way around, and just really take it sensibly. So you know, in the future, it's going to be an important event for you. So just see how see how it goes, and just learn your way around if you don't mind. And so that's that's how I want you to approach the event. Anyway, I arrived at scrutineering. I arrived at the last minute, just the day of scrutineering, and the other cars there, but no sign of Colin's car. I said, "Well, where's where's Colin? Where's his car?" And they said. Um, a um, bit of a story to that. Uh, it's in the paint shop. What do you mean, a paint shop? <laughs> he rolled it yesterday just practicing. I said, beg your pardon, practicing? <laughs> well, during the event, he had three completely separate accidents, all of them, each one of them rolling at least four or five times. On one occasion... Um, I remember they sort of they they thought that was the end. They were about to pack up and go, and Colin managed to drive it back out onto the road, and and I ended up knocking the roof out with a sledgehammer myself towards the end <laughs> of the event. And it was sort of, and you couldn't help but sort of love the guy and support him. And he won man of the man of the rally award, and they gave him a sort of big prize. And he became a flying fin from that moment onwards. Was it was it very difficult to sort of manage Colin because he he was so spectacular and fast as actually mm -hmm. I suppose his his weakness was actually getting him to finish and I, it was and I sort of almost look at him as a, a as a surrogate son you know he was uh, because I sort of you know have similar experiences with my own kids growing up and. Uh, uh, we did have a lot of heated moments at times, and we had lots of arguments about things. But uh, uh, you know, the, I've often looked back on all my different relationships with drivers, and I can sort of look back to dozens and dozens of them, and I wouldn't think there's any of them that at some point in time I haven't had an extremely serious falling out with, where we've not been speaking for weeks, we've lawyers involved, even all sorts of things going on. But I would say that. Every single one of them, bar none, over a period of time have come back to me and we've uh, made friends and we've sat down together and resolved our differences and become great pals ever since. And that goes for the likes of Jacques Villeneuve and uh, Colin. Jacques. And oh, Jacques. He was a difficult guy, wasn't he? Jacques was a nightmare to deal with. And, you know, and he realised it years later, how difficult he was. Um, uh, extraordinary talent, uh, extraordinary character, his own man, which I thought was... Uh, uh, you know, never afraid to speak his mind and sort of just behave the way he felt. Unfortunately, he was surrounded by some very sort of ill-advised people, in my opinion. And uh, so we had some very frank discussions at the time, and we did, you know, fall out quite seriously. Didn't speak to me for many years. And then one day he came to me at Abu Dhabi and said, you know what, I think we should sit down and have a chat about things and sort of 
you know, I really look back on those days and I think, the, you know, there are things I regret and could we have dinner together? So we had dinner together and, um, and, and that's been so often the case with lots of other drivers I can think of. I d we're going to come to F1 in a, in a second. But I just want to one more question on um, Colin. Where, where was there a particular moment when you thought this guy's very, very good and he will be world champion at some point or did it, that build over time? I think it was quite early stages, actually. I think you knew this guy was um, had an extraordinary talent. We remember in the early days, we brought him into the workshop and said, right, you're going to sort of work in the workshop during the week. You can drive a service van on the rallies at weekends with us, with uh, Marco Alem was driving. You can come down to sort of drive the van, help out. Very good mechanically. He knew his way around a car well, and I think that served him well, Which that period. For fortunate, considering his, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that, his ability to wreck I think, I think that education served him very well. And um, and then we put him into the British Championship. We said, well, we'll, we'll do the British Championship with you just as a starting point. And uh, he just dominated. You know, he was just in a world of his own. There was nobody could hold a candle to him. And it was, it was very obvious for everyone to see it an early stage. Now, Pro Drive, obviously, you mentioned the Porsche, the MG, History, Subaru, touring car programs, BMW, Alfa Romeo, Honda, Ford, GT Racing. Um, where, how and why did Formula One come onto the horizon? Because it, it was slightly down to David Lapworth, if I'm correct. Um, no, there's, some, there's, uh, there's, a, there's two stories to this. Um, the first foray into Formula One was uh, when I went into Benetton. And that came about because BAT had asked us and said, would we um, uh, like to sort of put a proposal together for Formula One team for them? They were very keen to get into Formula One. And so we did a bit of research. We came back. We'd won the World Rally Championship a couple of times by that stage. And we said, right, well, our view is that sort of the, uh, there are only four teams that have effectively won anything in Formula One at that stage. It was the sort of Ferrari, Williams, McLaren, and Benetton. And we said there's... Only one of those teams could be purchased, and that could be Benetton. So our recommendation would be to try and acquire Benetton or, or do something there. So I went to see the Benetton family. We had long discussions. There was a proposal on the table. BAT eventually turned around and said, no, we want to have our own team. We want to have a, a clean sheet of paper, Greenfield site. We'll do it all our own way. It must be unique. I said, OK. And um, so they went their own way and did that. Meanwhile, the Benetton family and I got on reasonably well. They wanted one of their young sons, Rocco, to to sort of take over the reins of the team and get involved. And I was asked to sort of come in and help and mentor him. And uh, so that was the first foray into to Formula One. And then, of course, the early days of BAR with the BAT money was pretty disastrous. So the, the idea of starting from scratch is quite a challenge in Formula One, as many people have found out. And we were called in two or three years in when things were looking pretty difficult and said, would we take over the reins and try and sort the thing out? And that's, uh, so that's how we got involved in the, in the BAR program. Um, going back to our live, non-live question, um, it's from Don, who's asking, what was the first thing you sorted at BAR? Uh, the first thing we sorted, we actually sat down, we gave ourselves a sort of traditional sort of 90 day grace period to sit down and work out a bit of a plan and a strategy. I brought the whole team with me. It wasn't just me. It was sort of, we had engineering people. We had uh, uh, sort of HR, we had finance, we had everybody. We came along as a, a bit of a you know small football team and we looked at every aspect and we said, right, well, um, let's just control the, we needed to control the costs. We needed to set sort of some clear goals. And, and actually we needed to reduce the size of the team slightly, which we did. And we, we stuck to that very, very strictly. So it's like you would do in any business. It's not sort of anything special about sort of a motor racing team. You just needed to get clear strategy around it and a, a clear direction for everybody involved. Uh, one of the most memorable elements of your time at BAR was obviously signing Jensen Button. Mm. And um, I mean, I always think he, he must owe you drinks whenever yeah. you go. You ever see him because I mean he was pretty bruised after his time at Renault. Yeah, he was, yeah, and I think it was um, it was a difficult period for him. He was coming out of a very you know he was thrown into the limelight very young. Um, it, it was um, you no, know, uh, and so many of these drivers are, and it's uh, it, it takes a very strong character to come through that period. Um, untainted by it and you know Jensen has matured now to a great character and a great guy and um, but those early days for him were difficult as they were for Colin McRae as well so I've seen lots of people in that situation um, but uh, no he was a great addition to the team because it also got the team rallied around him as well it was you know British team British driver 
made a difference. And he's actually a, a, he's a really strong team leader, isn't he? In terms uh, as a, as a driver. Now, now he is. Now I think he's really matured well. I think he's a great asset to uh, the McLaren organisation. So did you see that at that time when you, when you saw, was not it? necessarily? I don't think you know these things. You you evolve and you develop, but uh, that wasn't one of the initial thoughts. The initial thought was we needed a British driver in the team to build around. What, what was it like going into the F1 paddock, to having spent so much time with with rallying and sort of more what I would have thought was more relaxed atmosphere? Um, was it? It wouldn't have been a shock. Cause you obviously knew the industry well, but what were the sort of the main things that were so different? I think it's. Um, I think uh, how do I, I've, I've tried to describe it to people? Rallying, I think sports car racing to a certain extent, it's a bit like um, comparing golf with football, because it's um, rallying is an individual sport. You are it's you against the elements and. You know, you're not sort of affected by anyone else. No one's going to knock you off the track or anyone uh, is going to interfere with your game just as it is in golf. So, but um, Formula One is gladiatorial and it's, uh, it's you against the others and they, they sort of, uh, and, and people do tend to take that culture and behavior right the way through in everything they do in the, in the Formula One paddock. So it was a, you're right, it was a bit of a sort of, I knew, I knew the people very well, so it wasn't the sort of that side of it, but it was a very aggressive environment to work in and still still is to a, a great extent. And uh, I always used to say to people, uh, you say, what's it like doing a Formula One season? I said, I, I look back and I can imagine people going off to the Crusades. They'd sort of, they'd, they'd wave goodbye to the family and children, get on the horse and come back 11 months later. And, and, and that's about how it is in Formula One, if you want to be successful at it. It is one of those activities, as so many sort of major sports are where you have to give 101 percent and if you any less you're not going to win i have to say that um from my perspective when you came into formula one we um a lot of us found it quite refreshing in the media room because we were used to team principals who now you can only talk to them at quarter past four on a thursday mm -hmm. or whatever and you came in and you, you'd be wandering across the paddock and give one oh, david just ask you and you always had time to chat and and it was you'd come from a background which was much more open and much more accessible with rallying yeah. and Colleagues who worked in rallying used to say, "Oh, David, he's a he's a bit he's a bit too F one for rallying." With <laughs> and then when you came into Formula One, no, no, it's, it's, we thought it was. Yeah, well, you've got to strike a balance. Great. You've got to no, strike a balance, absolutely. haven't you? But it's um, no, I think I think there are so many crossover points in all forms of motorsport that sort of are common denominators. But each one of them, the, and the great appeal about it, all motorsport is each one of them has its unique traits and unique aspects to it, and, and that make them individual and appealing and attractive to spectators. Um, uh, we've got a couple of questions here, uh, one from Adrian and one from uh, Mario Pizzi, um, uh, regarding the drivers of BAR. Um, uh, Mario's question um, uh, is slightly naughty in that he says, at what point during your running of the BAR F1 team did you realise how overrated a driver Jack Villeneuve was? <laughs> um, so I, I will just tie that into another question uh, from Adrian, um, talking about do you think that different driver selections could have secured wins for the BAR team um, that in the seasons that you were in charge? What's um, I think drivers, I'll put it to you, and, and the choice of drivers. What the well, I, I, pros I, cons. I think you've got to also look at the, the, the car and everything around us. It was a very uh, young team at the time that was starting ground up, uh, so the equipment wasn't there, whichever driver you put in that car in the early days to win. So, you know, you can't sort of uh, hold everything against the drivers in that stage. Um, uh, I wasn't involved in the, uh, the driver selection in the early days. The only driver I was involved in was uh, getting Jensen into the team and then subsequently to Um And they were done for, you know, as so much of Formula One is done for strategic reasons, you know. I wanted a British driver in the team at the time. I wanted obviously the best British driver I could find. Jensen, in my view, was that and still is. Um, and I needed a Japanese driver to uh, appeal to Honda, and that's why Takuma came in. And he again was the best Japanese driver we had at the time. So sometimes you're not, you don't have the freedom to sort of say, "Well, I would love to have Schumacher in the team, or I'd love to have whoever it is today, the hot shot of the day." Interesting that you said um, you still think Button's the best British F1 driver. Is that okay? well? No, I, in an overall rounded shape. Obviously, you know, uh, there's no getting away from the extraordinary talents of Lewis. And uh, but you know, uh, as a sort of you know a mature driver with you know overall talents, I, I still rate Jensen. And what there's a there's a question here. I we'll find it probably in about five minutes' time um, about what happens to Honda after, after you left and why they struggled so much and never really had the, any success. What, 
of course, there's Braun GP, which was ultimately a sort of a Honda car and Honda money and work. What went wrong? Why did, why did they not have the success they should I, have? I wasn't there at the time, so I can't comment on what happened subsequent to us sort of departing. Um, we did have a unique period then when everything came together, because I don't know. Uh, we, the, we were... We, in the end of 2003, uh, the engineers came to me and said, look, you know, we need to get a better packaging of the engine. The engine's too big and too heavy. Um, the Japanese uh, engineers were focused on power and producing a thousand horsepower engine, not the packaging or the sort of uh, cooling issues that would make a great chassis. So we weren't sort of lined up together very well at that time. And it wasn't sort of, it was, that was the real issue for us to get that alignment. Um, but we did see an opportunity in that uh, Ferrari were changing to Michelin tires and we looked and they, we thought, well, they can't be changing to Michelin tires for no reason at all. That seems like a very good idea to us. So we had a relationship with Michelin through rallying and, and we flipped to Michelin early before anybody else. So we had that year of advantage and where we finished second to Ferrari. And I think had we uh, stayed on other tyre manufacturer tyres, we probably would have been sort of lambasting down in the middle of the grid again. Now, I'd, I've got a quote from you here. At least I'm, I'm 99% sure it's true. true. No. Well, <laughs> written, written, by, written by a journalist. Well, it's, it's written in Motorsport magazine, so I oh, desperately hope this is right. right. <laughs> it has to be so right. I'm slightly sort of feel as I'm hanging on a cliff edge here. Um, to have your own F1 team, you either need to be, be a major car manufacturer or a crazed multi-billionaire, and I'm neither. Um, <laughs> this coming from a man who's, who's come so close to entering Formula 1 on, on sort of a couple of occasions. What? Yeah, but uh, you know, there, are, there are points in time where opportunities do arise, where the funding's in place and, and the the big opportunity we looked at um, and I think that Huss has proven this now of how this form, way could have worked um, was when there was uh, there was going to be customer cars and that was the intent when the rules uh, the sort of a lot of the rules were opened up by Max Mosley and uh, he was very open about that that's what he was trying to encourage um, that was challenged at the time and it sort of delayed. We would have had a McLaren on the grid alongside the rest of them that year had, uh, had we not faced all the sort of legal challenges to the Concord Agreement and various other aspects that, that came about and ultimately delayed it to a point where it was impossible to do. But I still believe to this day, had we come, we would have hit the ground running and, you know, House has proven in the early parts of this season what they can do and I, I dare say they'll, they'll sort of mature and very far more quickly than a, somebody starting from the ground up. Do you think that Haas will, you know, because it's, it is a customer car, ultimately it's got so many shared parts with Ferrari, they're never going to be right at the front, are they? So until they take on more work themselves and do more parts themselves um, and have some more independence and therefore more cost and budget, um, they're sort of slight catch-22, aren't they? Because they, they can be sort of mid-grid, top 10, mm. but you'll never... Yeah, is it quite hard to motivate yeah, people? But yes, but you can't build a Ferrari Formula One team overnight. You know, to, you can't just do that. So, you, do you start from zero and build a team up from sort of which will take you five years probably to get anywhere competent, in my view, or do you start from the sort of taking the customer car point of view and and you leapfrog straight away into the mid midfield and then from there build an organisation that can compete with the top boys. Um, I, d I did actually, um, I've now found that question that I've, <laughs> I've asked you, um, that was from Matt, um, so organise this then. There's, I d I'm jumping around a bit, so I'm sorry about that. There's, I've just spotted another one from Kevin Joyce. I said, D does ProDrive still service XWRC Subarus and Minis that are running in the national championship? We do the Minis. Uh, we don't do any Subarus anymore. Uh, we basically, we, we had a policy of sort of... Um, uh, just once they reach a certain age, we'd move things down the line, and uh, and we have partner companies out there who've taken on all our spare stock and uh, and then look after people. So we've still got the capabilities internally with some of the Subarus and a lot of the guys. You know, we've got a few of them ourselves. We've got Collins' championship winning car. We've got a, one of Richard Burns' cars, and we've got an old Legacy as well from Harry. So we've got some of the cars there, and we do sort of have some of the parts around. But no, it's um. Uh, it's best left to the sort of enthusiasts to look after them once they get to 10 years old. And the minis we still repair. I was in the workshop yesterday looking at one that had come back from somewhere, so we still do work on those. Just coming back to the, the Dakar project you mentioned earlier, um, your most recent relationships in rallying w w have been with Mini and with VW with the Golf. Um, is this a new uh, relationship we should expect? A new, a new, or is it uh, an existing? No, it'll be a new relationship, completely new relationship. And I think, uh, I think. Um, 
there are a few things out there at the moment in motorsport that um, uh, I would be looking at now that's uh, for us, and that's obviously the Dakar, as we've talked about, but also the World Rallycross Championship, which I think is um, uh, undervalued um, for the, the costs of participation and the, the, the return that you can get from it in, in promotional terms, then it's a world championship, it's FIA recognised and promoted by IMG as well. So it's, um, that's something that I, I believe is going places. You, you've been prepared, or ProDrive has been preparing Rallycross Minis, hasn't it, in recent we times? Did a, no, we did a Mini a, a few years ago, and um, we never, uh, we didn't uh, run that properly. It was, uh, it was, uh, we sold all the, all the Mini parts to another company. I can imagine you getting your teeth into the rally cross from a promotional point of view as well, because it's as you say, it's got such great potential and it's been good so far. But, yeah, but it's got IMG be behind it as well, so I think it's it's got every reason to think it'll go very well. What is your feeling on what Dakar? I can see what appeals to you and your, mm. to your company. It gets massive TV coverage and exposure, media exposure. France, Italy, mm. Spain. Hardly at all in the UK. Relatively little. Why? Why do you think that is? Imagine if Jensen Button was driving in it. Is that, is, that, is that what you're telling us? <laughs> is this breaking news on the motorsport <laughs> podcast? <laughs> no, I don't think. I, I think that's probably the last. Like I think that's probably the last event Jensen Button would ever want to do in his life. But it was sort of. But nonetheless, it's uh, it's all about the British interest because whatever we say about British teams and British sort of enthusiasm, it's about British drivers that uh, the the public follow, and that's why Formula One is in such a uh, uh, high. Uh, position now in UK because of the likes of Lewis and, and Jensen as well before him um, and um, I think in France it's sort of probably at an all time low I suspect F1 interest yeah it's not it's not, it's not great well, no, I no, think no, if you no. tracked the participants you'd, you'd realise that's where it all came from I'm sure that there was more interest in the Dakar when Colin did it wasn't there? I mean, I, I was starting before my time. But remember, I don't. Re I don't recall there being a massive amount of interest. But I, I, I no, remember. I don't recall that either. But um, but I think it does take two or three years for people to sort of wake up to it. And uh, you know, it's. Uh, I'm I'm sure the potential is there. I think I think I think the British like the idea of adventure. And I think if we could communicate that properly, and it, you know, certainly on the continent, it has an incredible following. Do you have a time frame in mind in terms of? No, we're here. just we're constantly reviewing the situation we're looking at at the moment, and you know, fingers crossed we'll be there. I mean, how, how many to, to build a, to develop a program mm. like that for a company of ProDrive size? I mean, how long would it take to? We're normally looking at about. Uh, uh, well, he, here's a here's a, f a truism that we we work to. You know, you you give us um, uh, two million pounds in one year to develop something. Or one million pounds in two years, yeah, okay. and uh, <laughs> so we'd rather have longer time and less money to do things properly. And uh, so, in round terms, you're normally looking at most motorsport programs about eighteen months to get uh, to get a car ready and get everything up to running. Um, a week before Le Mans, obviously, we, mm. we really must talk about Le Mans yep. and um, Aston Martin going there next mm. week. Um, so you've been a big fan of GT racing for a long mm. time. You've been a big supporter of the World Endurance Championship mm. and all the good things we've seen coming out of it. Last year must have been a frustrating one for you, though, it because was. you were basically hamstrung the whole the whole year through the balance of performance. Yeah, we had a very bad. Um, you know, I think there's. I don't think the spectators fully understand balance of performance yet, and I think, uh, uh, and unfortunately, I. I've been very patient in the early days of it and believed in the philosophy of it. And um, of course, it takes a different mindset to get the entire engineering team to believe it as well. You, you, sort of, you basically, sort of, the engineers come to you with great excitement at the end of a season and say, look, I've got this great idea. We can do this and we can change this widget and we can spend this amount of money and we do this and we're going to go another second faster. So, and then what's going to happen? They're going to put 20 kilos of lead in the boot. You know, forget it. We're not going to do it. So you actually, you're, you're actually managing things in a very different way way you're looking at reliability you're looking at sort of serviceability of parts and and the whole philosophy that you where you have to design the cars different um the early days of balance of performance were a bit erratic and you know he who shouted loudest often got the best uh, the best uh, advantage um it's getting more scientific now it's getting better all the time but i still think there are being mistakes being made and i think last year was a clear indication of um, the the sort of imbalance that we had, and we just couldn't we couldn't succeed last year. They they, they got it wrong. The balance, and this year, I think um, uh, there's great suspicion about some of the competitors being sort of sandbagging at the moment. 
um, uh, when you go to a test day and all one manufacturer's cars are split by a tenth of a second, you think, hmm, a bit suspicious. But, um, and, um, but the interesting thing is, yesterday, and I, I, it should be on my emails this morning, um, we had the most comprehensive questionnaire we've ever had from the FIA come through to us, an ACO, about how we ran the car on the test day. To the point was, you know, uh, questions in the questionnaire were, um, do you think you can go faster during the race? Um, do, do you, there were a whole raft, you should get a listen, you should get a copy of this because this is quite intriguing and shows the depth to which they have gone to to investigate now to see that, you know, the, there's nothing going to happen that's sort of untoward and nobody's really sandbagging because if you were running a sort of completely ridiculous map on the engine that was sort of, you know, was 50 horsepower down, they would immediately know when you get to testing and the, uh, or to qualifying in the race next week. So they are starting to get better controls over it, and uh, we'll just have to see if they enforce them properly, which is one to, what's to be hoped to. Paul. So I, I laughed there when you, you know, the question of do you think you can go faster in the race? Um, if you do, then go. For, if you say no, we're absolutely on the limit, um, and you're actually sandbagging. Is there some form of punishment? What's well, that's the big question because then they'll have to investigate where that performance came from. And, and how do they then penalise you if that's the case? Um, these are we're funny, we were having this debate in the office yesterday because it's uh, everyone said, "Wow, they are really starting to dig deep now." That's um, and I think that's what's got to happen. But it's um, somebody said to me, "Try and describe sort of what the GT race is about now with balance of performance." And I thought about it for a minute, and I'd just come back from driving up the M1. And I said, it's a bit like taking a sort of Ferrari, a Porsche, an Aston Martin, a Ford, and a Corvette, putting them at the start of the M1, and saying, right, now get to the top of the M1 in Leeds with a 50 mile per hour average speed limit all the way and see who's first. <laughs> and it, it's who manages that process. Now, it seems a bit sort of, it's a bit ridiculous for, for to say that in motor racing terms because that's what you know people want to see the cars going flat out and they, but the truth of it is they are actually on the limit and you've just got to drive the perfect race you have got to drive you've got to be not just perfect on the track the drivers have got to be without any mistakes but you've got to be perfect in the pits as well our guys we built a special car for them to practice they they each tell me their teams have done at least a thousand pit stop practices before they get to le mans to to get all those things absolutely right so are you, are you against balance of performance or are you against uh, the, the detail in the balance well, of performance? Well, I think balance of performance is um, uh, a necessary evil. Um, otherwise, we would not have sports car racing the way we have it today. Um, it, it's great that we can have uh, a front-engine Aston competing against a mid-engine Ferrari, competing against a rear-engine Porsche, all with relatively similar performance. Uh, you go to different tracks around the world and you'll see different performance, but uh, I think there, uh, I can't imagine how else you could achieve that unless you just went for a silhouette formula. Um, and so I think the ACO are to be commended on it as well. The ACO have worked very hard at it. They're committed to it. Um, I do think that um, we end up a bit the bridesmaid occasionally in terms of the, uh, the PR coverage we get compared with the sort of prototypes. But this year, less prototypes involved. I think more focus on GT. I think it's going to be a, a great classic year. I was going to say that is there a slight frustration? I mean, you've got Ford, Ferrari, Aston, Corvette, etc., Porsche. It's you know the GT battle is going to be immense. I mean, you look at, you look at a Blancpain grid. You can get mm. 60 GT. Yep. I know the rules are slightly different. You can get. 60. Is it slightly frustrating that you are racing for you know 11th, 12th overall or something? And, the, and but it's this fantastic competition within a competition. Well, I think that's uh, I think that's one of the issues we have to keep promoting with the organisers and with our NPR. Um, I think the race at GT, I think there are 14 pro cars this year. Um, I guess that's more than the, far more than the LMP1 cars as well. And it'll be closer racing as well. So um, I think the, the, the true enthusiasts know what's going on there. And, um, and of course, Le Mans is just full of true enthusiasts. Yes. But I have, I have seen in the wider world people saying, oh, it's all very well Ford coming back, but they're only trying to win the GT class. I mean, well, <laughs> yes. It's not going to be easy. It's, it's not going to be it's easy, It's not going to no. be easy, yeah. that I can tell you. Well, where do you think the championship is at now? Because obviously Le Mans is this amazing mm. thing that has so much attention thrust upon it and there's so much world interest. The championship is still building, it's still work to do. Where, where oh. do you think it's at? Well, the, 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 the growth in the championship is there for everyone to see. Uh, the sort of audience attendance at races is good. I think the championship is very professionally run. 
Um, it's going to some interesting places now. Um, I was talking at Silverstone. They've got gr intro growing crowds there at Silverstone for the first round of the championship. Pity it's so early in the year and the weather's not so nice, but there we go. Um, and uh, no, uh, we're at a bit of a tipping point, I'd say. I think the next this season, next season is going to be interesting to see if they can continue the momentum. Uh, but it does come back to that point I was making that the product, the cars are exciting. The cars are interesting. And they, the, the good thing about the, uh, the technical regulations, certainly for the prototypes, is they're, they're, they, they open up to innovation. You know, the, the front of the field, you've got three very different cars with the sort of the Audi, the Porsche, and the, and the Toyota. They're very different products. So, and I like the idea that the ACO always put out these technical challenges and, uh, and embrace new technologies. And um, I don't think they'll stop doing that. What's what's of more value to you, um, a Le Mans win or a World Championship title? Um, I think the um, at the end of the day, a World Championship title is a, is a good one to get. But Le Mans is Le Mans, and I would always uh, t tick that box first. Where do you? What are your thoughts on the Ford um, and the sort of approach they've taken to to building um, sort of a this what some well, they, people refer to as a special but it is a special car it's a, it's a unique product it's a it's a, a you know it's back to the homologation specials really isn't it it's uh, but it's a celebration of uh, 50 years and, and the GT40 i think that's uh, that's you know if they if you come along with a, a special prototype if we built a special prototype at an Aston Martin mid-engine car especially for that task i don't think it would have been within the sort of spirit of the uh, of what that GT championships about, but I, I think Ford have got the excuse that it is around their heritage of GT40, and I think it's to be commended. And I think you know it's uh, it's great to see Ford back in racing. We've got we've got a question here from Richard Leach actually about um, the likes of Ferrari, Porsche, Ford, and the amount of financial investment and technical investment they're putting into their GT programs. Is that something that's becoming sort of increasingly difficult to compete against with, with Pro Driver? Was as you alluded to earlier, you actually don't spend money on that minute eye of detail to get extra speed because you'll get sandbag. No, it's, uh, you're right. Uh, I think that we are fortunate without, if it was an arms race and it was a free for all open regulations, Aston Martin couldn't afford to be there and we certainly couldn't be there. But um, the way it's done now with the balance of performance allows. Uh, Aston Martin to be competitive on the grid and uh, we've just got to look at every aspect of that and see you know, where we can gain advantage. When first I went to Le Mans in 1978 I stayed up for 24 hours because I was only 17. <laughs> With maturity I too tend to try and sleep a little bit. Um, how, how, lo how much of it do you stay awake for? I used to, like yourself, I used to stay up all night and it's sort of, but I do tend to, I stay in right in the middle of the circuit so I can just nip away and get a few hours sleep at a time and I just a, a couple of hours early evening and then come up in the middle of the night and see what's going on and then go back a couple of hours so it's, uh, no, I'm, uh, I'm sort of, I leave it to the youngsters to stay up all night. The, the trouble with it is, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago, often the races would often get into a pattern and they weren't always that exciting mm. and you could actually go and get some kit but mm. these days they're so close i think That's this the year the gt category you will probably not want to go to sleep you'll want to wait up all night and see what's going to happen I, re I remember one year when damien and i decided to do hourly updates on the website um for the whole 24 <laughs> hours it was oh, without yeah. like, the worst decision we've, we've <laughs> ever had and funnily enough we're not doing it this year we'll have lots of great content uh, apart from that um I'd st we've, we're running out of time um so a question that probably doesn't have the shortest of answers, but it would be interesting. Um, this is from someone called JS73091, um, whoever you are. That's, that's um, quite, a, quite a Christian name. If you were in charge of Formula One, what would it look like? Well, uh, you know, that's, uh, I'm sure you get lots of glib answers to that. And, um, but it, it evolves where it is today for lots of valid reasons that people don't sort of often recognised. I think uh, for me the one thing I would be looking at is um, I'd reduce the aero impact on the uh, on the category and uh, an increased mechanical grip and uh, I think the the influence of aerodynamics unnecessary aerodynamics in in that and the, the money spent on that is is somewhat irrelevant it's uh, you know I was I always find it slightly amusing when they sort of say, oh, there's an enormous new tweak come on the Ferrari. Look at the front wing. There's a new extra blade on the outer end wing, end plate or something. And it's, um, that to me is, uh, they, they, don't, they don't benefit by the look of the cars any longer. I think some of the classic cars are the, the simpler designs of, of previous years. And um, so aerodynamics is the area I would change. 
Um, speaking of error, before we finish, I, I must ask you about the America's Cup because mm. I know you know, obviously this is a very big passion of yours. Yeah. Pro Drive's involvement in the in the in the project with Ben Ainsley. Um, tell us a little bit about. Well, the, the, the interesting thing we've talked all about our motor racing history at Pro Drive and uh, the things we've done in motor racing and across the different formula, but the interesting point today is that the company now probably only thirty percent of it is working on motorsport also by by revenue. And the rest. We've got to go on for another two hours then. Well, <laughs> I tell you, I've, just, I've, just, uh, I've spent an hour on the phone this morning talking to some people about a flying car, which we're working uh, with some people in Bratislava to try and help them. Is this the one that Gordon Murray's no, interested in? Different one. I, well, I, Gordon never mentioned it to me. I don't I know, think sorry, it was, the bo- it was the driving boat that okay. um, he was. Yeah. Oh, no, that's the other one we talked yeah. about. No, that's another project. <laughs> um, but the no, flying car, so we're, we're sort of looking to work with these people very closely, and that's a, a one interesting project. Uh, we're working on the America's Cup, as you've alluded to, with Ben, who's. Um, and he actually took me out on the boat down on the Solent the other day, about a month back, and. Uh, uh, a sailing boat that does 40 knots downwind is something quite extraordinary. 30 knots upwind as well. So it's, uh, it makes my little wooden sailing boat down in St. Moore's look a very pedestrian. <laughs> um, and then um, we've been working on the Composites Division that's building uh, the Mars Rover satellite for um, Mars in 2020. Um, we're building a, a folding bicycle at the moment, the lightest weight folding bicycle in the world, uh, which should be, uh, be available later this year, weighing under six kilos. Um, jet engines working on some of that type of work, working on tilting trains. We're doing all sorts of interesting things. So the the great thing for me about this is that the the the, the lessons we learn in Formula One, not necessarily the lessons we learned in, in motor racing, rather, um, it's the whole culture of an organisation and the way that it behaves, the way it thinks, the way it's motivated, can translate those initiatives in that area into a another meaningful. Um, uh, l- engineering exercises that um, that you know still keep Britain at the leading edge of this uh, type of technology. I, d- I think we're definitely going to have to get you back to talk flying cars and tilting trains. Well, um, we have to do a flight test of this car. Fly me. Yeah. How is this going to work practically? Yeah. Well, let's leave that for another story. Okay. <laughs> 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 um, Passengering Ben Ainsley on his ridiculously fast boat. Yeah. I mean, any any comparison there with being a being alongside Harry Vatten in a, in a Ford it, Escort? Well, the, the interesting... Uh, no, you're in an environment you're not so familiar with, which is the first thing, and you're sort of dressed up to the gunnels in, in weatherproof kit because the water is just flying all over you. And then you're having to leap across the, the one one hull to the other hull, which is sort of, you know, the, the youngsters were a little more athletic than that than I was, but I learned a rolling technique after a while. But um, but it's uh, the, the thing that impressed me most of all was the, 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 the loads on all the equipment... Um, and you hear this thing creaking and groaning and sort of, you know, big carbon sort of bits of kit and, and loads of five tons on some of the some of the sort of elements of it. And you think, wow, if anything, this was to break, you know, you'd be um, you'd have a few problems. But it's uh, it, it is it is the Formula One on water and um, and Ben and his team, I think, uh, and of course, with Martin Whitmarsh in the team now as well, leading them there, I think they're in with a great shout of, of doing extremely well in the America's Cup next May in Bermuda. Is, is Ben comparable to racing drivers you've known? I think he is. Um, ben, we took him out to Silverstone, and in fact, you covered the story. Um, when we put him into a GT4 car last year, he, we, he and I have been chatting about it. He said he'd love to have a drive of the GT4 car. So we, we took him there, and Darren sat in the car with him. And I was in the thing that impressed me most of all was his level of concentration. He was just totally, totally focused. He could, and I think being single-handed sailing in dinghies and things like that that he's done all his life and Olympics and stuff, I think that requires... A, you imagine you're looking for every wind shift on the water. You're looking for every little advantage you can find. The concentration levels that he manages is, uh, you know, what you'd see in a Formula One driver. Amazing stuff. I d- we are going to have to call time on it there, but David, thank you so much for coming in. I know how busy you are. Always um, good fun. So, um, thank you very much. Thank you to Damien, to Simon, Alan behind the camera, and Jack doing all the social media and handing me my non-live live questions. Uh, we'll see you all again next month for the 100th Motorsport Magazine podcast, which is very exciting. Um, yet to, um, t- to confirm the guests, but you will, it'll all become clear next month. So see you then. Bye-bye. Don't forget that over the past six months, Motorsport has been delving into an audio archive. 
Back in the late 1970s and early 1980s, Rob Widows recorded a radio show called Track Talk on Radio Victory. He interviewed the likes of Bernie Eccleston, Nelson Piquet, Derek Bell, John Surtees, Sterling Moss, and even Motorsports' Dennis Jenkinson. We've digitised all of the Track Talk tapes, and these are available through shop.motorsportsmagazine.com. I can't recommend these highly enough. They're amazing windows into the past for only £1.99 per download. (laughs) 